I was a 16 year old girl growing up in a sheltered household. I was a nerd and I still am. I did a lot of online roleplay because I found it was a great outlet for my writing and I really enjoyed the people. On one forum, I met a guy named John. John and I had a lot of fun roleplaying and eventually our characters ended up together which brought on real feelings between us. He told me he was 17 and going to high school in Washington while I lived in California. We would talk for hours online, messaging one another, sending pictures back and forth. Well, things took a step up when he asked me to go on video chat with him one day to prove that I was a girl. This was brought on because we found out that one of the more sexual role players who cybered a lot online, which is basically having sexual roleplay, turned out not to be a female after all, but actually a dude. Seeing as I trusted John, I agreed and got on camera. He didn't have a cam, claiming that he used the family computer and couldn't convince his parents the need for one. My older brother was in the military at the time, so we had one to video chat with him. Eventually, being on cam with him became a regular thing. Just me sitting there on cam and him typing back. That's when he started to ask me to do more sexual things. It started out simple, like, give me your best sexy look or bite your lower lip. I thought it was harmless flirting and complied like an idiot. He would tell me he was falling for me and I was beautiful and me, being a teen girl with issues with my image, fell for every single line. We became boyfriend and girlfriend, as much as you can be with someone who you've never actually met. I was so desperate to make him happy and keep him around, because I'd had two boyfriends in the past, and both of them ended with heartache on both sides of the coin, so I was lonely. So, when he started to ask me to do more sexual things on camera, and I hesitated, he would always use the line, I thought you loved me, and I'd cave. For a long time, I felt ashamed of myself and dirty. Now I just feel stupid. He would send me pictures of his penis via well-placed digital camera angles that never actually showed his face, that he would upload an email to me. It made me uncomfortable, but I wasn't going to make him angry and tell him to stop, because I thought I needed him. Then, things got worse. We texted back and forth, but when I wouldn't text him back right away, he would start bombarding me with messages of why I hated him and why I wouldn't answer him, and claims of me cheating on him. It was overstressing me so much that I finally caved and told one of my female friends about it, and she told me that his behaviour was abusive and I should tell him to knock it off or break up with him. So, I did. The next time he went off on me, I told him, I'm not okay with you emotionally manipulating me, so either stop it or we're done. He lost his shit, started cussing up a storm, calling me names, saying I was a horrible person. So, I told him we were over. I cried for about two days, which is forever in teen girl time. It hurt, but my friend consoled me and told me it was for the best, and that I'd move on to something more healthy. He started to message me every time I got online. His messages ranged from calling me names to begging me to take him back because he loved me. I finally blocked him and left the forum game where I had first met him. He would make a new Yahoo account and message me again with the same shit. Then he started telling me he was now suicidal because of me, and that I should feel sorry that he was going to kill himself. Because I'm a nice person, I fell for it, hook, line and sinker. We talked for hours via text, and I took him back if he promised not to hurt himself. He said he wouldn't hurt himself if he could see me again online so I got on cam with him. Then he told me to do more sexual things for him, and I tried to say no, but he said if I cared about him I would, or he was going to slit his wrists. 
My friend's words pop back into my head of, you're a good girl and you deserve someone who isn't going to manipulate you. I told him no, to fuck off, and to not message me anymore. I blocked him, made a new email, and thought it was done. Fast forward about two weeks. I had not heard anything from him in these past two weeks. No texts or emails or anything. I thought I was in the clear and done with him. One day, after school, I was waiting by the bus stop in front of the school to head home. I wasn't alone, but in a crowd of classmates and friends as we waited. Suddenly, a brown sedan pulled up, and a man in his mid-twenties stepped out of the car and started saying my name. I looked around because A. I was in a crowd of people, and B. My first name is very common, so I thought maybe he was talking to someone else. That's when he walked straight up to me and grabbed me, very roughly by the shoulders, and started pulling me towards his car. I screamed out for him to let me go, but his fingers were like iron. Luckily, the other students took action, and some of the guys rushed the dude and tackled him to the ground, while some others went to get our school police officer. He kept screaming my name, and telling them to let him go, and that he was my boyfriend. I was stunned, to say the least. The cops came and put him in cuffs. Apparently, this man was John. He lied to me about his age and where he was from. He had tracked me down to what school I went to, which he discovered from a school sweater I had worn one day on webcam. The cops searched his car and found rope, duct tape, sleeping pills, some woman's clothing, and a big fucking knife. After the investigation, my parents told me what his plan was from his testimony. He was going to, quote unquote, take me away and we were going to get married and be happy. It still makes me shiver to this day. I've kicked myself for years over how stupid I was to give this person I knew nothing about information about me, as well as manipulating me into doing what I did on webcam. He had a record from what my mother told me, that included the rape of a girl when he was 19 and she was 14. The last time I saw him was when the cops took him away, and he just kept staring at me from the back of the police car, crying. I know it's cliché, the typical creeper on a dating website thing, but this is my story, and it still shakes me to this day. I didn't have much dating experience at the time, this was back in 2008, and I was going to be a junior in college. I lived in a small town outside of Takamo, Washington, and attended a university nearby. I was home for the summer, and I wasn't taking summer classes that year. I was 20 years old at the time. I had an account on several dating sites, but I wasn't looking for anything serious. One day, in early July, I received a message from someone called Anna Richardson about maybe meeting up as she lived in Takamo and attended Everest College. She was a year younger, going into her sophomore year. I checked out her profile and she had several pictures in addition to her icon. She was interested in art and literature, was majoring in mathematics, listened to EDM and alt rock, and played soccer. The woman in the photos was very attractive. She seemed pretty legit, and we seemed to have some things in common, so I agreed. We messaged on the site first. She was thinking we could have dinner at a local Italian restaurant and go for a walk afterwards. I thought that sounded fine, and suggested we meet at the restaurant on Saturday at 7 or so. She said she was thinking that I could pick her up from her apartment as she didn't have a car to use at the time because she had recently gotten into a crash. This was kind of strange to me, and I wondered why she couldn't ask someone for a ride. But I stupidly agreed to pick her up, and she gave me her address. 
I wanted to be seen as a gentleman by my date. All of this proved to be my biggest mistake. We then exchanged phone numbers, and we spoke on the phone only once, and it was brief, just discussing the details of the date again. I'd pick her up at her place at around 6.30, and we'd go to the restaurant at 7. It was a female's voice on the phone, and it didn't sound old or anything, so I wasn't really worried about anything. So, on Saturday, I got directions to her place and set off. She lived in a pretty nice section of town, in a town home, with three stories that was a condo type thing I guess. She informed me that her landlord owned the building, and lived on the first floor, and rented out the top two floors. Anna lived on the third floor. There was a set of stairs on the side of the townhome, where there was a door to each floor, but the first floor also had a front door. It was kind of a weird setup. I went up the side stairs to the third floor and knocked on the door. It felt like I waited there forever, about five minutes before someone answered. A rather large, middle-aged man with the most bizarre look on his face opened the door. I don't even know how to describe it. Other than that, there wasn't anything weird about his appearance or outfit. Now, my warning bells are going off, but I guess I had the idiotic thought that maybe he was her dad? So I dumbly said, Um, is Anna here? But decided it was time to get out of there, and I didn't wait for a response, and tried to turn around. He literally grabbed my arm and rasped, I'm Anna. I was smaller, shorter, and much younger than him, so it would have been quite hard for me to fend him off. I kept trying to wrench away unsuccessfully, and began screaming for help as he repeatedly tried to pull me through the door, and then finally just let me go. I didn't hesitate to take this opportunity to get the heck out of there, and thankfully, he didn't try and follow me. I got into my car and went home. I was frustrated that no one had heard and tried to help me, and immensely freaked out, naturally. I didn't know if I should go to the police and tell them, or even what they'd do if I did. That evening, I told my roommate the whole story when I got home. He knew I was going on a date, but didn't know the circumstances and obviously didn't know about the guy. He convinced me to report it to the police and to take pictures of Anna and I's messages if I still had them, just in case. I went down to our local police station the next day, and informed them of the whole thing, and provided them with the pictures. I kind of got the vibe that they weren't taking me seriously, but they said that they would go down to the guy's house to question him about it. They had me file a report. Now, this is the really crazy part. The police telephoned me the following morning, I wanted to hear from them sooner, but whatever, I know they're busy. They told me to come by, because they had some information about the guy. So I did. And they told me that the guy had just seemingly vanished. They spoke to the landlord, and she said he must have left in the middle of the night because his car was gone that morning. I guess the landlord had a key and opened the door to his apartment, even though they didn't have a search warrant but all his stuff was apparently there. The landlord told them that she didn't know much about the guy, but that he seemed normal enough but didn't leave his apartment much. She provided them with his name. They did a background check. Nothing. The police advised me to delete my account on the website, and suggested that I change my phone number just in case, so I did. They told me at that point, there wasn't much else they could do. I never got any follow-ups or updates on my report, and I never encountered that guy again. Of course, I still have many questions. Who did I speak to on the phone? It wasn't a pre-recorded call, because she addressed me by name, and knew what I was talking about. Who was the girl in the pictures? I don't know where he got them from and I didn't know about reverse image search at the time. And finally, 
What were his plans? It was so bizarre. Number three. When I was 14, I lived in a small suburb in the Midwest, full of ordinary people who didn't quite share my interests in goth metal and David Lynch movies, so I often took to the internet to meet people with like-minded interests in the hopes of some stimulating conversation. Add to that, I had recently come out as gay to a couple of close friends as well as my mother, who didn't take the news well at all. I didn't know any other gay people in real life. So, at the time, the internet felt like the only place to meet other people sharing similar experiences. This was back in the days of dial-up, when it wasn't too uncommon for strangers to strike up an IM conversation based solely on their AOL profile. One day, I received a message from a guy around my age named Steven. It started off pretty normal. We talked about our favourite music and movies, how much we hated school, and all the celebrities we thought were cute. He eventually revealed that he was 16 and was living with his older brother because his parents had kicked him out because he was gay. I thought it was cool to meet someone who lived nearby that was old enough to drive and didn't live with their parents, so we decided to meet up after a couple of weeks of super long chat sessions. I knew my parents would not be cool with me meeting a stranger from the internet, so I lied and told them he was a mutual friend of another friend they already knew and trusted. Once the plan was set, he showed up on a Friday evening in an old beat-up pickup truck. To my relief, he didn't look like a creepy old catfish stalker. In fact, he looked just like his pictures. Red hair, goofy smile, but definitely not unattractive. We went for a ride, grabbed a bite to eat, stopped at a guitar shop, and caught a new movie at the theatre. I was so excited to have a friend with similar interests who knew about the pressures of being gay in a small town, and was happy to chauffeur me around. I decided I didn't want the fun to end once curfew drew closer, and I asked if he wanted to crash at my place. I had a trundle bed that pulled out from beneath my bed, so he could sleep comfortably without the pressure of something sexual happening. After watching a DVD, we both passed out for about an hour, when suddenly there's a loud knock at the front door. My parents awoke to find a police officer standing at the door. He was a friend of the family, as my dad was a retired cop. I went out into the living room to see what was going on, and he proceeds to tell us that they received an anonymous call that someone in our house had been communicating with a wanted paedophile. My parents went straight into my room where my computer was, and forced me to downgrade my AOL account to kids only, while my new friend slept soundly nearby. I told them I had no idea what they were talking about, but since I was pretty much the only person using the internet extensively in our family, they said I would be banned from regular use until the mystery was solved. The next day, Stephen and I went for a ride, just enjoying the day, when all of a sudden, we passed an oncoming SUV who slammed on his brakes and did a squealing 180 degree turn only to begin tailgating us and honking his horn furiously. I was screaming at my friend to slow down and asking if he knew what the hell was going on. Who was this crazy person behind us? He didn't say a word. We wound up in a high speed chase that felt like hours, but probably only lasted about five minutes. Stephen finally pulled over and jumped out of the car and motioned for me to follow. So I did. As we're pulling out, the driver behind us headed straight for me and went to punch me square in the face, but stopped mere centimetres before actually hitting me. I pulled away from his shaking fist and saw a man in his thirties with eyes bulging out of his head. Literally. I much later realised he had Graves' disease, which, if any of you have seen what that looks like, it's nothing short of terrifying on an angry man about to beat you to a pulp. This man went on to tell me that my new friend was actually 21 years old and that he was his boyfriend and that I needed to stay out of their lives if I wanted to live to see tomorrow. Once the initial shock and confusion wore off, 
I was absolutely broken. Scary Graves guy took off with Stephen and left me in the dust. I made my way home and didn't say a word to my parents. I just locked myself in my room and cried harder than I've ever cried before. I felt pretty damn stupid and ashamed for being so naive. I hoped the whole thing would just blow over without anyone finding out. But the story didn't end there. My older sister and I had our own landline phone number, separate from the main house phone that we shared, and kept the answering machine in my room. I came home from school one day, and noticed my mum was already home, which was odd because she didn't usually get home from work until a few hours later. I went straight to my room to find a new message on the machine. It was the Graves dude, who went on to leave a voicemail, but my sister had picked up mid-message so I could hear their conversation over the recording. He pretended to be a faculty member of my school, and asked my mum's work number. He wound up calling her, and giving her a detailed account of just who exactly I had been hanging out with. I went out to the back patio where my parents sat, looking just absolutely devastated, as they informed me that two FBI agents were on their way to get a report about my experience with Stephen, who, by the way, wasn't actually named Stephen. It was a fake name he had been using. Once the agents arrived, they informed me that he was wanted for the alleged molestation of two children, one of them as young as 10 years old. Needless to say, I was sick beyond belief, and fucking angry to boot. I complied with everything they asked me to do, and agreed to testify against him on trial. I wasn't going to allow this lying fucker to get away with hurting any more kids, and apparently, the other families involved were so embarrassed they didn't want to testify, leaving only me to do something about it. Around this time, I received a late night phone call from Steven's boyfriend, asking if I was okay, checking up on how I was doing, and eventually turning the conversation around to a more flirtatious tone, and complimenting me on my musical tastes and appearance, etc. At this point, I realized this wasn't just a jealous, possessive boyfriend involved in a game of cat and mouse, but rather some kind of partner in crime who reveled in younger boys just as much as his disgusting significant other. I quickly hung up and never spoke to him again, though he did attempt to call me a few more times after that, according to the caller ID. Fast forward one year, when Stephen's court date finally arrived. I went to the courthouse downtown with my mum, and was informed by my attorney that he had taken a plea deal and would be sentenced to jail for one year. Yeah, that's right. He only got one year because his victims refused to come forward in testifying. Another year later, I was 16 and finally had my own car along with a great group of supportive friends. I had pretty much buried this memory far away in the recesses of my mind and never really thought much more about the encounter until one day I started to receive instant messages from an unknown screen name. These IMs consisted of death threats and facts about me that he could only have found out from driving by my house and stalking me, like what kind of car I drove, the type of clothes I wore, what my daily schedule primarily consisted of, etc. This went on for a couple more weeks from various mystery handles, sharing in explicit detail how I was going to die. I was pretty freaked out, and kept a close watch wherever I went. However, I never saw him creeping around, in spite of the heightened awareness of my surroundings. I eventually printed the IMs out, and shared them with my school principal, along with the police, assuming no doubt it was Stephen attempting to contact me, hell-bent on revenge. After filing a report, I luckily never heard from him again. I don't know what became of him. I don't even remember what his real name was. I can only hope something truly horrible has happened to him since all this transpired. Update. About one year after stalking me as a 16 year old, I was able to discover that Stephen wound up in another state and was convicted on aggravated sexual assault against a nine year old boy 
who testified against him in court. He was sentenced to 70 years in prison. In the images on screen now, I've included a snippet of the judge's conclusions on the 2004 court case that took place after Stephen was initially sent to jail for a year. Names and certain details have been removed due to privacy reasons. Additionally, the original poster has also included this profile from a website that inmates use to find pen pals, where Stephen has posted pictures of himself as well as a personal biography that is both delusional and despicable, according to the original poster. He adds, This guy is seriously a piece of work. That said, I'm so very glad to know that he'll be rotting in prison for the rest of his life now. Hey there, fellow explorers of the eerie and mysterious. Welcome back to the Blue Panic channel. I've got some exciting news to share with you all today. So, you know, you know how we've been diving in into the chilling world of electric chair executions and all things spine tingling? It's been quite the ride, hasn't it? But guess what? We're shaking things up a bit. <laughs> That's right. While those videos have been a blast, I've been feeling the urge to venture into the realm of horror stories and creepy pastas. I mean, who doesn't love a good scare, right? And here's the best part. I'm doing it for you, my amazing subscribers. I want to bring you even more thrilling content to sink your teeth into. Plus, I'm hoping to welcome a whole bunch of new friends into our spooky little family. So to all my existing subscribers, thank you for sticking with me on this journey. And to all you potential new subscribers out there, buckle up because things are about to get seriously spooky around here. Get ready for goosebumps, hair-raising tales, and maybe even a few sleepless nights. But hey, isn't that what we're all here for? <sighs> Thanks for tuning in, and as always, stay curious, stay creepy, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, keep your flashlight handy and your doors locked. You never know what might be lurking in the shadows.